Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started since it's six o'clock. Um, welcome to tonight's workshop. So I'm really excited for this topic. It's a really important one. And before we get started, I just want to know who's here. So go ahead and put your name in the chat. Um, just let me know your name. And if you'd like to include a little fun fact about yourself, I'd like to know what city you're joining us from, or you can tell us what county or state. Nishi's here from San Francisco. Beba, hi, I'm from Guatemala. Hi, Beba. Uh, Rajesh, uh, Rajesh Kanwar, okay. Joining from Irvine. All right, if you're just joining us, I'm asking everyone to put their name in the chat and then if you can include what city or county you're joining us from. Sepa said hi from Tiburon. Nice to see you. Nader from Marin County. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well, I'm really excited to have you all here. And if you're just joining us, let us know your name in the chat and what city you're joining from. So tonight's workshop, as many of you already know, is about nutrition and ADHD. So we'll primarily be focusing on how nutrition can impact our brain function, our cognitive health and our mental health and our ability to focus. Um, we won't be talking about a clinical diagnosis of ADHD, and we won't be going into details about symptoms of ADHD as that can get very extensive and it does require a clinical diagnosis, but we'll focus a bit more on the impact of nutrition. All right. And before I get into tonight's workshop, I want to tell everyone a little bit about our practice and what makes us very unique. So at Pacific Integrative Psychiatry, we take a holistic approach to mental health. So not only are we thinking about what's going on with our brain and our mental health, but what other things are going on in the body and how are they contributing to our mental health. So the services we offer include psychiatry, which involves medication management and integrative forms of treatment. So we have two integrative psychiatrists at our practice, Dr. Nishi Bhopal and also Josh Habinski, who's also taking new clients. We also offer psychotherapy, which is coaching and mindset work. And we have a therapist at our practice, uh, Andrew, who's also accepting new clients. And then I provide one-on-one -on -one nutrition consultations. So looking a bit more at what are your symptoms telling us? Why are they happening? And how can we utilize functional medicine testing to get to the root cause of what's going on with some imbalances in the body? And if you're interested in learning more about our practice, our website is right here, pacificintegrativepsych.com. You can learn more about our services. You can schedule a free discovery call and see if we're a good fit for you. All right, so what to expect for tonight's workshop? We have these workshops once a month, typically the third or fourth Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. They're over Zoom, and even if you're not able to join live, I still recommend signing up because we will send you a complete recording of the workshop afterwards so you can watch everything that you might have missed or re-watch even. And participation is highly encouraged and welcome, so feel free to type your questions or comments in the chat as we go along. Um, we even sent, send worksheets in the emails that um, we sent to you prior to the workshop, so it's a great place to take notes as we go along. You can even write down your questions that you may want to remember for later. And then lastly, please respect everyone's privacy if people share personal information on here and try to minimize distractions as we go along. Okay. And for our workshops, we typically do a monthly experiment. So something you can try, take away at home, um, something new that you want to practice in your lifestyle, nutrition. And last workshop, we actually talked about the impact of nutrition and sleep. So for those of you that were here last workshop, I want to hear from you. Did you try something new? Um, what did you learn and how did it go? So, for example, maybe you tried to limit caffeine around bedtime. Did you try to eat your dinner a little bit earlier to see if it helps you fall asleep faster? So tell me a little bit in the chat who was there and what experiment did you try? Oh, I see some new names. Natalie from Los Altos, Laura from Mill Valley, Maggie from New Hampshire. Welcome. 
Someone said my experiment, more protein at dinner. Yes. Yeah. We talked about, you know, how different types of foods, not just when you eat, but what you eat can impact your sleep quality. So someone said trying to eat more protein, maybe less starches around dinner time. Did anyone else try an experiment? So let us know in the chat. Um, Kirtana said, I cut down my coffee intake. I only drink one cup of coffee now and only 90 minutes after waking up. Yeah, I have more energy than I did before. Yeah, that's a really good one. And I know oftentimes it can be hard to not have your coffee right as you wake up, but this way your body learns to become energized in other ways. So maybe just by looking at the sunlight, um, sometimes people work out in the morning so you can increase your energy naturally versus depending on the caffeine. So offsetting that caffeine intake by just 90 minutes can really help your energy levels. Good. All right. Thanks for sharing. So feel free to still include your answers in the chat as we go along. Um, but I am going to go ahead and get started. So tonight I'm joined by Dr. Nishi Bhopal, who's our integrative psychiatrist and sleep specialist at the practice. So Nishi, I'll let you take over. All right, great. Well, welcome everyone. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn from ILAR tonight about nutrition and ADHD. Um, and so before we jump in, I um, just wanted to uh, just provide a quick disclaimer. What we're talking about tonight is not medical advice. Uh, so if you have specific questions about your own health, um, or treatment plan, please talk to your healthcare practitioner for specific advice on that. But um, we're going to be talking about the role of nutrition in ADHD and also just kind of general brain health, focus and attention, because nutrition is fuel for our brain, right? So our body and our brain require neurotransmitters to function. And those neurotransmitters are synthesized from the food that we eat, right? So you can think about our nutrition as the building blocks for these neurotransmitters. So things like dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine and acetylcholine, all these things that are implicated in mood, but also in focus and attention. Uh, so we're also not talking about a substitute for conventional medical care, right? So for ADHD, the standard of care is medication and um, some behavioral interventions as well. But nutrition can be a really important adjunct to care. And um, in some cases, you know, it can be very, very effective. Um, and then also just mention that there's limited research on nutrition. Right? There's a lot of research on pharmaceuticals and medications, and there's a lot of funding for those types of studies. There's less funding for nutrition studies. So what we're going to be talking about today is based on emerging research um, and emerging data, um, but we still do need a lot more information and research to, to really understand the nuances and subtleties of nutrition and brain health. So with all of that said, let's go ahead and jump in. And um, I think we'll start by talking about sugar and the role of sugar on brain health and attention and focus. So Ilar, can you tell us what, like, what is the role of sugar? Because glucose or sugar is the primary fuel for the brain, right? But too much of it can be problematic. So can you speak to that and, and how sugar might affect ADHD? Yeah. So, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of growing research, there's new findings and studies, but one thing that we do know is that our cells like to use sugar. They use sugar for energy. Um, we get sugar from a variety of different foods. So some people, even I have clients asking me, well, how much sugar should I be eating daily? And I have to explain, you know, we actually get sugar from specific types of foods. So what our cells do is they use the sugar for energy, but we have to properly extract the sugar or turn the starches into sugar. And it has to enter into our cells with the use of specific hormones, um, even neurotransmitters that signal our brain. But as you mentioned, too much of it can be harmful. So what tends to happen is the more we eat sugar and the more we start depending on sugar for our energy, the more our bodies crave it. I've especially noticed this in people who start their day with sugars. So first thing in the morning, you spike your blood sugars. That's your energy for the morning. So your blood sugar spikes, and then it's followed by a crash. And 
What we also know is that blood sugar spikes are uh, correlated with hyperactivity. So when we have that spike, we become more hyperactive and we like that feeling and we like that sensation. So we want more of it. And when we have the crash, our brain also tells us to go and get more sugar to get the blood sugars back up as quickly as possible. But what we can do instead is to try and use other ways to help, like you said, um, increase our dopamine levels, serotonin levels, all of these neurotransmitters that are associated with um, conditions like ADHD, and some people might have lower levels. Um, and we want to have these levels elevated more naturally. And I know sometimes, you know, clinical diagnosis medications may be involved, but nutrition, lifestyle management can make a difference. And the research is now starting to support it. There's new findings. So for example, considering things like, how are you sleeping? Um, are you meditating? Are you exposing yourself to sunlight? And most importantly, what we're talking about tonight is how are you eating? So what do your eating habits look like? Um, are you starting the day with something sugary? Do your meals mainly consist of starches, carbohydrates? And this tells us that your body is dependent on the sugars and it likes the sugars for energy versus using other types of foods. Um, there's a research study um, that was looking at eating patterns and dietary interventions um, in people with ADHD. And they were looking at elimination diets. So for example, eliminating uh, foods that a lot of people are sensitive towards, um, especially things like, you know, fish, soy, nuts, uh, gluten, dairy, eggs, and how does this really impact ADHD related symptoms? So they did a five week elimination course. And what they saw is that there was um, a 40% improvement in ADHD related behavior in children who had um, ADHD. And they also limited starches and sugars um, in their diets. So in this controlled study, they found that limiting sugars and starches actually reduced ADHD-related symptoms and hyperactivity, and it actually allowed them to improve their mood and ability to focus. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. In some of these studies, um, and this might have been actually from the same study, which was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So basically, it's 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 looking at thousands of studies, right? So they've compiled a lot of the literature that's already been done on nutrition and ADHD. And so just adding to what you just said, um, one of the meta-analyses found that the Western pattern diet pattern, so that's kind of like our standard American diet, which is sad, right? It's the standard American diet. And, uh, you know, it's rich in processed, processed foods, red meat, refined cereals, and then lots of sugar, soft drinks, sugary drinks. They found that this type of diet increases the risk of ADHD by 92%. That's pretty compelling, right? Like just by changing your diet, you can decrease the symptoms. Now, having said that, you know, there's lots of, we're not going to the diagnosis of ADHD and the neurobiology of it, but there are, um, you know, genetic components, but even our genes are affected by what we eat and our environment, right? So we can't control our genes, but we can change and modify our behaviors and our nutrition. Um, could you talk a little bit more about sugar and specific foods that maybe we should avoid if we want to improve our focus and attention or things that we should be looking out for on food labels? Because it won't say sugar on the label, right? Like it'll say like high fructose corn syrup or something like that. So can you speak a little bit more about that? Like how do we know if we're getting too much sugar? Or like what are some things to look out for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, these things start so early on, we're exposed to so many high sugary products, especially for children. It's really important to look at product labeling and mislabeling, or how are we being tricked maybe a little bit by food and drug companies? Um, you know, do the labels look more attractive, especially I know for kids like cereals, for example, they look really colorful. They have the cartoons, the cereals maybe have rainbow colors versus the ones that just look bland, don't look as good. So a lot of times what I say is try to look at ingredients more than anything else, because it tells us where are the sugars coming from. And a lot of people tend to look at nutrition labels and say, oh, you know, it has so many grams of sugar, so many grams of fat, but where are these sources of fat and sugars coming from? So like you mentioned, there's so many different names for sugar nowadays and different types of sugars. Um, so we have high fructose corn syrup. We have things like brown rice syrup. 
Uh, we have sugar alcohols where products can now be labeled zero sugar, um, but they still taste sweet. And it has to do with these sugar alcohols that has that have to be used in very minimal amounts to get just the same amount of sweetness. And people think, oh, you know, this is healthy. This is a healthier alternative. It's not spiking my blood sugar, but the chemistry that's going on in the brain and the sweetness that our brain detects can still affect us in some ways. And people notice it might increase their appetite or it might actually increase their cravings for sugary foods, despite the fact that it's not spiking the blood sugar. So what we want to do is first, we want to try and limit added sugars as much as possible. And there's a label. It says that, you know, on most products, you should see sugars versus added sugars. Are the sugars naturally coming from things like, you know, dairy products tend to have natural sugars, uh, or the sugars might be coming from things like fruit in the product, uh, dates, you know, uh, they might be coming from things like maple syrup or coconut sugar, which can be lower glycemic index, meaning that they don't spike your blood sugars in the same way. So trying to limit added sugars as much as possible and then minimal ingredients as well. So the first ingredient uh, is the highest in quantity in a product. So if the first ingredient is sugar, you know that this product is mainly consisting of sugar and the sugar is in highest amount. So if it's a cereal and it starts with sugar, that cereal is basically all sugar. Um, you know, if it's as a high fiber cereal and you're trying to eat more fiber, I would recommend eating fresh fruits and veggies, legumes, nuts and seeds to get your fiber. So reading the label and understanding what the label is telling us is really important. And then understanding the sources of the sugars and also how much added sugars there are versus natural sugars. Okay, great. That's super helpful. And I just um, put a list in the chat of different names for sugar uh, so people can copy and paste that if you want, um, just some support with reading food labels and <clears throat> excuse me. And just to your point that you made at the beginning about when we, you eat sugar, you get, um, insulin dumped into your system and then that then reduces your sugar. And then you get this crash. And then that crash looks like lethar like lethargy, like fatigue, like problems with concentration, um, difficulty with decision making. Um, you know, it's just harder to stay focused. Uh, so keeping your blood sugar stable um, is a really important way to kind of maintain your focus and maintain your energy levels throughout the day. Um, so what are some, so if someone's eating like a sugary breakfast cereal, let's say they're having uh, Fruit Loops for breakfast or something, what's a good alternative to that? Yeah. So, you know, there are actually some healthier cereal options out there now. I've seen cereals made with things like cassava flour. Um, they're sweetened more naturally with things like coconut sugar or honey or maple syrup like we talked about. So if someone is really insisting on starting their day with cereal and they hate granola and they don't want to try an alternative... I'll look into seeing healthy cereal alternatives and seeing, okay, how can this actually be incorporated into your diet in a way where you're not hating what you're eating, but at the same time, we're finding a way to make it healthier for you. Plus, one of the most important things is not starting your day with the cereal, not starting your day with that high starch sugary food but maybe starting your day with a protein, like maybe just having one egg first or having some nuts. Some people just do like a spoonful of nut butter and then they move on to their starch or sugar. And that can help a lot. The protein can help with controlling your blood sugar before the starch and sugar is introduced and it has a chance to spike the blood sugars. Other healthy alternatives, granola can be a good option. Um, homemade granola, especially, you know exactly what ingredients go into it. You can use things like a variety of nuts, like almonds, walnuts, cashews, oats. Uh, you can use seeds like chia seeds, flax seeds. You can find healthy granola options now. Um, there's gluten-free options for people who are gluten sensitive or intolerant. Granolas that are sweetened more naturally or even have no added sugars. Uh, maybe they have like dried fruit in them, which can be a good option. Um, you can combine it with yogurt, which is also going to add a lot more protein, some plain yogurt, some healthy granola, maybe some fresh fruit, and you're getting a lot more fiber, healthy fats, and protein into that breakfast versus just having this cereal, which is going to be mainly starches and carbohydrates. 
Yeah, I like that idea of, of adding in the protein just to kind of keep things balanced and you don't have to overhaul your whole routine in the morning, but it's about making some of these small changes uh, just to give yourself a little bit more balance and then kind of building from there. And if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand or, or drop your questions in the chat or any comments um, as we go. So, okay, so let's let's move on to talking a little bit more about um, nutrients. So we've been talking about sugar, you've mentioned protein, you've mentioned healthy fats. So um, let's talk about some of the macronutrients to include in your diet to support focus and brain function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked a bit about the protein and healthy fats, as you mentioned, and they can be a good preventative approach for avoiding blood sugar spikes and crashes. So when our blood sugar is really low, it's hard to go for the high protein, high fat option because our brain is telling us to get the sugars to spike the blood sugars as quickly as possible. So one way to avoid this is eating more regularly. So try to get your meals in as consistently as possible, getting your three meals, maybe two snacks in between, and making sure that those meals consist of good sources of protein, healthy fats. So there are certain um, hormones and neurotransmitters in the body whose precursors actually come from uh, things like protein and healthy fats. So for example, uh, amino acids like phenylalanine and tyrosine and vitamin B6 are precursors to dopamine, which we talked about can be associated with ADHD or our ability to focus, um, our cognitive function. So in order to get these amino acids, we have to eat enough protein and we have to get good quality protein in our diet. Plus we have to digest it properly in order to extract the nutrients. So on average, adults require about one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. And when I initially mentioned this to some people, it sounds like a lot at first, um, because, you know, let's say somebody is 60 kilograms, they're going to have to eat about 20 grams of protein per meal to get the 60 grams of protein throughout the entire day. Um, as an example, one egg has about six grams of protein. So if you eat three eggs, you're getting about 18 grams of protein for just that one meal. Other examples are about three ounces of chicken, fish, turkey, uh, plant-based sources, about a cup of black beans, for example. So figuring out ways to increase your protein intake, as you mentioned, can help a lot with managing your blood sugars, which can also improve your ability to stay focused and help your brain function throughout the day versus just doing it for one meal and then not for the rest. Um, and I always recommend starting with one meal at a time. So if your goal is to increase protein intake, maybe start with just breakfast for the week, then move on to lunch, then dinner and meal planning can be really helpful. Now, when it comes to healthy fats, we can also get energy from fat. And we always mention healthy fats because we don't just want to be eating fats in our diet. We want to be focusing more on the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And examples include things like fatty fish, uh, like salmon can be a really good source of uh, healthy fats, avocados, olive oil, variety of nuts and seeds like chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, pumpkin seeds. So trying to get more of the healthy fats plus the protein can help with your cognitive function um, plus uh, avoiding uh, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, which again, these are blood sugar spikes and crashes, which can be associated with um, an inability to focus um, and pay attention throughout the day. Excellent. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to reiterate that point about the, the healthy fats, our brain is mostly made up of fat right? So about like 60% of the brain is fat and, and fat has a physiological function in the brain um, because the neurons are surrounded by fatty cells. And then those fat cells are involved in cell signaling, right? And we know that with ADHD, there's a problem with cell signaling and dopamine signaling, and that's why it's hard to focus. And we have a lack of dopamine in certain areas of the brain um, and we have improper signaling. So by getting enough healthy fats, you're supporting the actual structure of your brain, right? Which is going to help with its overall functioning and the integrity of the brain. And that's going to have downstream effects on your ability to focus and your memory and cognitive functioning and decision-making and all these kinds of things. So this is why like, it, it's so important to get enough healthy fat for ADHD, but also for general brain function. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, when, when we say this healthy fat, um, we're talking about 
the the polyunsaturated um, fatty acids. So mostly things like omega threes, and you just listed out the foods that contain those. Um, and just another statistic here. So from that same meta analysis, uh, they found that people who are eating um, a diet with fruits, vegetables, fish, um, and high levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids, um, and also micronutrients, which we're going to talk about shortly, um, people who included a lot of these things in their diet decrease the risk of ADHD by 37%, right? So again, it's, it's not saying, we're not saying that nutrition is going to cure your symptoms of ADHD or, or anything like that, but certainly it, it does have an impact um, and it can be quite a significant impact. Um, and so there's a question here, would sugar substitutes have the same effect on brain function like stevia or sugar alcohol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a really good question. So sugar substitutes or sugar alcohols, you know, as we mentioned, they don't spike the blood sugars in the same way. So they're considered healthier alternatives for individuals who are at risk for hyperglycemia, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes. But what it does to the brain is it actually tricks us into thinking that a meal is on the way. So for example, if you're starting your day with coffee and you're putting stevia in your coffee instead of cane sugar, you still taste the sweetness and it can actually increase your hunger later on in the day. And the brain tends to think that you're about to eat very soon. So what you might notice is that you actually might become more restless, more anxious as you're getting more hungry and it can make it harder to focus and pay attention. So I never recommend having these, um, sweetened beverages or um, alcohol, sugar, alcohol, sweetened beverages on their own. If you're choosing it as a substitute, make sure to have it with a meal or after a meal, um, try to minimize it as much as possible. Uh, but again, it can have that effect. And because of how it affects our hunger and our brain um, and its ability to kind of associate that signal with a meal being on the way, it can really uh, affect your ability to function because of how it associates it with food. Great. So um, let's move on. Uh, or if anyone has questions, again, please feel free to drop them in the chat or um, also come on camera and, and ask your question. We welcome that too. Uh, so let's talk about micronutrients, right? So we've, we've talked about macronutrients. So macronutrients are your car carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Um, and then can you explain what a micronutrient is and what micronutrients we should think about with regard to ADHD and focus? Yeah. So, you know, the macronutrients again, are things like the fats, the carbohydrates or starches, protein, micronutrients, we think more of as the vitamins and minerals that go into our diet. So things like magnesium, zinc, the B vitamins, and the reason why these are so important is because they are, are involved in every step and every chemical reaction, neurotransmitter signal. So every signal that the body is sending involves these micronutrients, even, you know, the way our brain functions, the way our heart functions, our digestive system. I always think of the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, and this is how our body converts food into energy. So if you think about it and we're missing certain micronutrients, we can't take the macronutrient from one step to the next and convert it into energy or ATP. And we offer a really cool test at our practice that I love to use that really shows us these steps and what key ingredients are missing. So we can help supplement um, with those or um, provide nutritional needs that can help support it. So when it comes to uh, ADHD or uh, cognitive function or ability to focus, certain micronutrients have been studied. So specifically, there was um, a narrative review in 2022, so fairly recent, that looked at eating patterns and dietary interventions in ADHD. And it found that altered levels of nutrients like vitamin D, iron, zinc, and the polyunsaturated fatty acids are associated with aggravation and progression of ADHD. So these are, these are specific uh, micronutrients that have been studied and can actually worsen symptoms uh, that are related to ADHD or our ability to focus. So um, we also have to uh, have these micronutrients for hormone production. So for example, vitamin D is so crucial for hormone production. And you can imagine all the different things our hormones have to do from our cognitive function, you know, um, to producing uh, things like melatonin that affect our sleep. 
So for example, um, the micronutrients that have been studied when it comes to ADHD include things like iron, which can come from foods like beets, uh, legumes, like beans, lentils, spinach, eggs. Uh, another micronutrient that's been studied with ADHD is magnesium. Um, and magnesium is super important for cognitive function. And a lot of people tend to be insufficient um, or deficient in magnesium. And it can show up in a variety of different ways, like um, being constipated or not being able to sleep well. And you can get magnesium by eating a variety of nuts and seeds, uh, dark green leafy vegetables as well. Uh, another micronutrient is potassium. And you can get potassium from things like bananas, coconuts, avocados, tomatoes, uh, zinc as well. And you can get zinc again from nuts and seeds, legumes. And then lastly, vitamin D, as the study mentioned, which you can get from dairy products, mushrooms, fatty fish like salmon, tuna, sardines. But as you can see here, you know, when we break it down and we talk about what kind of foods you have to eat to get these micronutrients, we basically just have to eat a whole foods diet as much as possible. So the more fruits and vegetables we eat, the more good sources of protein, nuts and seeds. And if you imagine you make your, uh, your eating habits different, you make your meals more colorful, you focus your shopping more in the whole foods section, less in the aisles where the processed and packaged foods are, you're going to be able to get a lot more nutrients nutrients, macro and micronutrients, which are super important for our brain function, and it can really improve your ability to focus. Great. And we've got a question here from Natalie. Um, mm -hmm. With meds such as Ritalin, there can be reduced appetite and weight loss, especially in kids. Any recommendations on what foods to focus on to compensate? Mm, yeah. So, you know, I would say when it comes to weight loss and supporting a healthy way to maintain or gain weight, we really have to focus on nutrient dense foods. So I try to take an individualized approach and it has to be a really comprehensive assessment um, that can take, you know, up to an hour to do. But um, we look at things like how big are your portions? Um, are you skipping meals? Um, what things stimulate your appetite? Do you like going for walks outside or maybe you eat more when you're around family or friends? But then packing your meals with nutrient-dense foods the times of day that you are eating. So eating a lot of those polyunsaturated fatty acids, things like fatty fish, um, if you eat a plant-based diet, eating things like avocados, maybe putting a drizzle of olive oil onto your veggies or onto your starches. Um, I even recommend things like sprinkling your meals with hemp seeds. They have very little flavor. You might not even notice them, but you're packing in extra nutrients into your meals um, or things like nut butters, you know, maybe just make a piece of toast with some peanut butter or add a scoop of um, nut butter into your smoothie or into your oatmeal. So what are ways that we can pack in these nutrient dense foods and then also make sure that um, the individual is eating regularly and trying to stimulate their appetite um, in the best ways possible. Yeah. And I think um, just adding to that, I think the nutrient dense foods are, are really crucial. And, um, you know, as Natalie mentioned with, even with adults, you know, they have appetite suppression when they're on uh, stimulant medications and uh, people with ADHD studies show that people with ADHD tend to gravitate towards the more carbohydrate rich foods and tend to consume less protein. And so really focusing on those foods that are higher in protein and, and higher in um, those healthy fats that we've talked about, I think it's really important because it's also going to help reduce cravings. Um, so I just listed out some of those, the types of foods to include, and even like a handful of nuts is great. The nut butter, like you mentioned, um, and then, you know, various sorts of sources of protein, depending on whether or not you consume um, animal-based or, or plant-based proteins. So like beans and lentils and things like that. Um, so again, just to underscore the idea that nutrition provides the building blocks for the body and brain, um, both for the structure of the body and brain and also the, um, the building blocks to produce the neurotransmitters like dopamine, which is highly implicated in, in ADHD. So you've mentioned, so Ilar mentioned um, iron and she mentioned zinc and vitamin D. So zinc um, regulates dopamine production. Um, and people with ADHD are shown to have lower levels of zinc generally. Um, this applies to both adults and kids. 
Um, and there's some studies showing that zinc supplementation can actually make Ritalin more effective. Um, and I've seen this in my practice, in our practice, where sometimes if a patient feels like their medication is, is kind of wearing out or it's, it's not as effective, adding in some nutritional strategies can oftentimes help boost the efficacy of their medication. And, and sometimes that can be pretty striking. Um, and then Ilar mentioned iron as well. And so there are studies showing that even um, supplementing with iron rich foods or, or iron supplements in kids that don't have anemia could potentially help their ADHD symptoms. So having said all this, we don't recommend going out and buying iron supplements or buying zinc supplements because, or even vitamin D because um, you can take too much. So one thing that we offer is testing. We like to test these levels first and then determine what a person might need. So uh, sometimes it's a nutritional intervention. Sometimes it's even using a dietary supplement to, to bring those levels up. So I just wanted to mention that um, as well. Um, okay, so there's another question. Uh, this question from Kirtana, are protein powders also a good way of supplementing the protein requirements? Because a lot of them do have added sugars or alternative sugars. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I know a lot of people use protein powders. I myself use them too. So I think it has to do with how you use it. So as Kirtana mentioned, you know, there's so many different brands out there and looking at the ingredients can be helpful. So I don't recommend a protein shake. I do recommend making your protein, um, smoothies or shakes uh, on your own as much as possible. And with the protein powders, you can read the labels and see, is it a whey protein? Is it a pea plant-based protein? And where are the extra nutrients coming from? So you might see things, just a list of vitamins and minerals, which basically means that they've been produced in a lab, or you might see things like chia seeds, you know, kale, quinoa, which means all these vitamins and minerals are actually coming from whole food products. Now, when it comes to smoothies, um, which is the, I think the main way that people would use protein powders, unless you're adding it into like your oatmeal or something, you're basically blending up your food. So you're not digesting it in the same way. And if you are using a smoothie or a protein shake as a meal replacement, it's really important to know that the fiber you're getting from those fruits and veggies has been altered because it's been broken down in the blender. You're not breaking it down in your digestive tract. So I still recommend trying to get the other two meals. Let's say one meal a day, you have a smoothie, but then the other two meals, you try to eat more whole foods. You try to get more fiber, um, maybe protein from other plant-based sources or lean sources as much as possible. And if you are having a protein powder shake or smoothie as your meal replacement, try to incorporate something crunchy on top or on the side. I always mention this because what happens is when you drink your meal, your brain doesn't think of it as a complete meal, right? Because what happens is you're not chewing, you're not digesting, breaking it down in the same way, because again, the blender did most of that work for you. So people find that they get hungry way faster, like an hour or two hours after they have their smoothie, they they're like, Oh, I'm hungry again. Like I had 20 grams of protein. Like that smoothie had like 600 calories. What's going on? And, and it's because your brain didn't associate that with a complete meal. It thought more of it as a beverage. So you can either have some nuts on the side, on the top, maybe some crunchy component inside the smoothie, because when you start to chew and you break down the food, you're releasing different enzymes and your brain is now signaled to say, this is a complete meal, not just a beverage. That's a great tip about adding something crunchy to the smoothie. Um, mm -hmm. I'll need to try that too. Mm -hmm. So um, just being mindful of time, we're coming up on the 45 minute mark. Um, so if, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to, to ask. And I hope this um, has been helpful uh, and just getting, you know, getting you to think about, okay, how can you support your brain health um, and focus using the power of nutrition? Um, okay. So there's a question here. Does lion's mane help at all with ADHD? Hmm. That's a good question. So I know that people's experience with herbs and supplements can be different, um, especially when it comes to um, like lion's mane, chaga, you know, ashwagandha, things like that. So 
I really recommend starting with a small dose. If you are experimenting, it's best to work with a healthcare provider so they can kind of manage, you know, your symptoms from the start to where, where your goals are and to make sure that you're getting your nutritional needs in addition to supplementing with herbs. Um, but there have been a lot of, you know, positive feedback from people who do use things like lion's mane chaga. So I think it can be helpful, but it can also be very individualized. If you are trying to incorporate things like lion's mane, chaga, ashwagandha, make sure that that's the only thing that you're changing in your routine, right? So let's say the entire week, you're only adding a small amount of lion's mane to your smoothie or whatever it may be and pay attention to your body. Get curious, see, is it helping? Um, Sometimes it might just be the placebo effect. Sometimes it might actually be working. So I think we kind of have to take it with a little bit of um, grain of salt, but at the same time, I think I've heard a lot of positive feedback. Nishi, maybe you have a bit more experience. Yeah. You know, it's, it's tough with, with supplements um, to, to really determine their efficacy because again, there aren't a lot of studies done on them. I just did a quick search just to see what the literature says about lion's mane. And um, there's actually no studies in humans. Um, There's some animal studies showing that maybe it could be helpful, but still kind of inconclusive. So the short answer is we don't really know, um, like from from an evidence-based perspective, it wouldn't be an evidence-based treatment. Um, Having said that, as Ilar said, uh, you know, people have different experiences and we do use nutritional herbs, supplements, botanicals in our practice. Um, We try to do it in an evidence-based and safe way, but um, sometimes people do have anecdotal positive reports of it. So um, yeah. So the short answer is, uh, we don't know enough yet to make that determination. Yeah. So since we are wrapping up, um, I'm just going to share my screen again. All right. So we've kind of reached the end of the workshop. And again, we're going to talk about our monthly experiment. So I know we talked about a lot of different things, but I always recommend trying to take at least one or two things away that you want to apply in your life and making them very specific for you, setting a goal, something you want to try. And we just recommend getting curious. So paying attention again to your body, your cognitive function, maybe your ability to focus, seeing how it, how it feels. Um, So for example, I have some some listed here. Maybe you are trying to eat more whole foods, less refined sugars. Maybe you want to increase your intake of protein or polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I'm curious right now, does anyone have an experiment in mind, something they want to try? If so, feel free to just type it in the chat or you can raise your hand. You can turn on your camera or your audio and you can share it with us. Um, And again, we really encourage you to come back next month for the next workshop and share with us your experiment, share how it went. Uh, Maybe you can write it down on your worksheet as a reminder. Uh, Let's see here. Okay. Yes. I would like to increase my omega-3 intake. Yeah. And I love that. And I think omega-3s are something that we can all use more of. A lot of people don't get enough omega-3s in their diet, or they get a higher ratio of omega-6 compared to omega-3, which can also be more inflammatory for us, not as healthy for our cognitive health. And I recommend getting really specific with that. So sometimes it can be hard to say, okay, how am I going to increase my omega-3 or did I even do it? So saying, okay, every morning for breakfast, I'm going to have, you know, a handful of walnuts and that's how I'm increasing my omega threes. It's simple. It's something you can track, you can measure. It's just applied to one meal. And sometimes it can feel less overwhelming. Um, Laura said, check zinc and iron, then include more in my diet. Um, Also, I'm sure it's variable individual, but is there a general daily amount of uh, sugar recommended for an adult? Um, So yeah, I really like the fact that you first want to check your zinc and iron levels just to see how much your body really needs rather than just supplementing, which I know a lot of people can do. So seeing is there a need and then how much of it do you need to take? Now, when it comes to getting sugars in our diet, again, we can get sugar from breaking down starches and carbohydrates. So I don't recommend focusing so much on how many grams um, of sugar you need to be getting in your diet, but rather how many um, carbohydrates or especially complex carbohydrates are what I would recommend trying to include in your meals. 
And these are starches that have whole grains, they have fiber, they have a lot more nutrients, even things like micronutrients that we talked about, you'll find things like the B vitamins and the complex carbohydrates, and trying to include a serving of um, uh, complex carbohydrates in all of your meals. So we don't have to be afraid of carbs, but it has to do with the type of carbohydrate, the quality of the carbohydrate, and how you're combining it into your meals. So when you add a protein with the carb, you'll notice that your blood sugar doesn't spike in the same way. Um, yeah, Kirthana included a link that you can click on. It's in the chat and you can learn more about our practice and how to get, um, schedule a free discovery call. Um, Dr. Ma Maggie Hellman said, I'm going to cut down on the amount of stevia I use. Yeah. And that's a really interesting experiment to try. I know sometimes it can be hard because your body is used to having that sweetness um, in whatever um, you know, you're using the stevia in, maybe it's a beverage. And I recommend gradually cutting back on it, just like you said, cutting down on it rather than completely eliminating it, maybe going from one teaspoon to half a teaspoon, trying that for a couple of days, seeing if you notice a difference. Pay attention to your digestion, um, your appetite, your cravings, and also your energy level and your ability to focus as we talked about today and see how it um, affects your energy when you combine, let's say the stevia sweetened beverage with a meal. So if you're having your coffee that has stevia with a high quality protein meal, especially for breakfast, I think the combination of those two together can provide you with more energy. All right, great. So if anyone else has more um, monthly experiments, something you'd like to try, please feel free to type it in the chat. Okay, a little bit of a recap about where we went today. So we talked about nutrition for ADHD. We discussed macronutrients and eating for focus and brain function. We also talked about vitamins and minerals for ADHD. And then we talked about a monthly experiment, something you can take away and try at home and then come back next month and tell us how it went. All right. So if anyone has any more questions, please free, feel free to write it in the chat. And if you have suggestions for future topics, please let us know. Um, you can visit our website. Uh, the link is right here, pacificintegrativepsych.com. And Kirthana also included a link in the chat if you prefer to click on that. Um, and we invite you to come back next time. We're going to have a new topic. Um, each month we have a free workshop. It's a new topic connecting our brain health and our gut health. So the way we eat and how it affects the way that we function and our mental health. So we definitely invite you to come back. Um, you're welcome. All right. Great. Yeah, I know we went a little bit over time, but thank you so much everyone for attending and we hope to see you all next month. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>